Good morning, everyone. My name is Jenna, and I want to be the first to welcome you to Ship Church and say Happy New Year. If this is your first time here, we want to say welcome and thank you so much for joining us. If you're interested in learning more about us, you can go ahead and scan this QR code and it will tell you everything that you need to know. No. No. <laughs> January 30th is our last Sunday in the theater, so say goodbye to the amazing recliner chairs. <laughs> oh, I can't remember what I say after that. Noisy recliner chairs. <laughs> that Sunday will actually be uh, loading all of our equipment up and then going to the new building to start unloading. So if you would like to help and stay, the more the merrier. It's gonna be a lot of fun, so exciting. All right, that's all I have for you guys today. So the lead pastor, my dad, is going to Joe is going to tell us a few things about us going into the new year. This, can you go ahead and show that? Uh, this is Turleton, Oklahoma, okay? Turleton, Oklahoma. Turleton is in Pawnee County, Oklahoma. It is located one half mile south of US 412 and US 464, or US 64 on Turleton Road and County Road E0570. The population, it was 106 people. Uh, which was a gain of uh, how many people? Oh, uh, 15, 15 people from the previous census. It is best known. These are the two things that this town is best known for. It was struck by an F4 tornado in 1984. The other thing that Charlton is known for is an explosion at the Arlix Corporation fireworks plant in 1985, all right? Which sounds like something from a Batman movie. We're like Joker. No? Okay. It was also, and more recently, it was one of the primary filming sites uh, for the FX show Reservation Dogs, if anybody saw that. 100% of its population works in Tulsa, travels to Tulsa. It is, in, word, in one word, nondescript. There's nothing special about this town. But something special happened in this town on February 15th, in the year 1998, in the late 19th century, <laughs> 1900s, not 19th century, in the late 1900s, which is what the kids are calling it these days. So it's the late 1900s. In 1998, something special happened in that town. Two teenagers stood on the porch of a trailer in Turleton, Oklahoma, on the road. Yes. Two teenagers stood there, and just after midnight, they shared their first kiss and fell in love. Well, uh, if I'm being super honest, that young man fell in love. The, the young woman took some convincing. Uh, but I knew, I knew in that exact moment that um, I would marry Tori. Um, I, I knew right away I fell in love instantly. I knew right then and there. And yes, those are blonde tips. I don't know if you can see them. But you know, honestly, love is a funny word, right? Love is a funny word because I can say that I love my wife, but then that I could also say I love my kids, but that, that's different, right? I can also then say that I love pizza, and then I could say I love the Dallas Cowboys, but all, all of those would be different definitions of the word love. It carries lots of different meanings, uh, lots of different weight, right? The weight when I say I love my wife is different from I love this thing. It is a different weight. It's a weightier word. Um, and you, so you get my drift. And so when we say that we are called to love, we are called to this radical kind of love, we have to answer, answer the question, what does the word love even mean today, right? So in Luke's account, in Luke's account of Jesus' life, we've got the four gospels, right? Just a quick review. Gospel literally means 
just a proclamation of good news. There is a new king and a new kingdom. And doing so was subversive because Rome had its own gospel that Caesar was God. So then for these guys to come up and say, that's great, but we've got this other gospel was completely subversive. But in Luke's account of this, he talks about this idea of love and what it actually means. And in chapter 10, we see, we see Jesus answering a question where this religious leader, this expert of the law comes up to him and it's like, hey, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, when we read that in our culture and context, especially in today's church, we read that and think, what do I do to get into heaven? But that's not what he was asking. If you put it back into its context, he's not asking, what do I do to live forever? Because that's not, that's not what he's asking. He's asking, how do I have a certain kind of life? How do I live a life of certain weight, of certain depth, of, of, um, of meaning, abundant life, life in the new age? And so let's take a look. It's going to be in Luke chapter 10, and we're going to start with verse 25. We're going to go to 29. And it said, one day an expert in religious law, you have uh, NIV up, yeah? Let me switch that real fast. So uh, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is and who is my neighbor? Which is a really good question. But he's just trying to justify himself. He's like, okay, well, I've done all of this stuff, but who, what else, you know, how do I do this? And uh, who's my neighbor? Like, who do I get to exclude? Who do I get to, who's in, who's out? Who can I love? Who can I not love? Can you explain it to me? Right? Now, Jesus then tells a familiar story that we've probably heard if you've ever been in church at all. You, even if you haven't been in church, you've heard the title of this story. To answer this question, but also our question about love, who is our neighbor and what does it mean to love them? All right, so look at Luke chapter 10. We'll have it up here for you guys. It's the, the story of the Good Samaritan. We're gonna go 30 to 37. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed, on by, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring, oil and, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day... Oh, I went too far, didn't I? No, nope, I'm sorry. I lost my place. Well, the next day he went out and took two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Now, in this story, just as some context, Jesus is using a very familiar rabbinical teaching model of threes. This is a familiar story. It's like a, 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 a priest, a preacher, and a rabbi walk into a bar, right? Then it's literally the same. So the normal, the normal pattern would have been a priest, and the priest would have gotten it wrong. A Levite, which is like an assistant to the priest, would have come along and gotten it wrong. And then a Pharisee would have been the third option, and the Pharisee would have come and gotten it correct. So Jesus is using this, and so they're very familiar with this, and so... Uh, they're waiting for this like normal pattern to take, take place. But then all of a sudden, Jesus throws them this like wicked curveball. Now, Samaritans were a hated race of people. All right. It goes, I won't go into the whole history, but it goes all the way back into the New Testament. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years where uh, the Samaritans in intermingled with a, another race of people. And so the Jewish, the Jews basically looked at them. And they had their own worship system. And they had their own place of worship outside of Jerusalem. And so as bad and horrible as it sounds, not only did the Jews hate them, they saw them as subhuman, as half-breeds. So it's this deep-seated, 
racial hatred that they had, generational. And so not only did Jesus put this hated race of people in the protagonist seat, he also puts them in the God character. Now, in the teachings of Jesus, we see uh, like a, a shepherd, somebody planting a, a, a field, somebody baking bread, going off to look for something that's lost. And when we read that, we always put, well, maybe, maybe you don't, but I do. I always put myself in that spot in the good guy role. We've talked about this before, right? We like the fairy tale through it. We're always the good guy. We're never the good guy in the story. We're never the farmer. We're never the one searching. We're never the one planting. That's always God. God is always the one that's doing, the one that's planting, the one that's rescuing, that's one that's searching. God is that character, not us. And so then all of a sudden, <laughs> Jesus puts that person in the protagonist role, but also in the God character role. Can you imagine how offended, insulted these people would be? He put the most hated and marginalized people group in the place of God, made him the hero of the story, and then told them, now you gotta go be the same. Now, in much of our church's context of today, if Jesus told this story, I would imagine that you know he was like leading a study, a small group, or, or, or a Bible study, or, or maybe standing up in front of a group of people um, and telling the story like a pastor comes along, and then maybe like a, an elder comes along, and then, in much of our context and our church culture today, I, I would picture that it would be more along the lines of, and then comes this leftist, socialist, transgendered person in the God character role. And if you had any kind of gut reaction to that, like, what, wait, what did he just say? Then you can begin to understand how the Jews felt when he put this marginalized people group and how radical the story actually is. So look, uh, look again at verse 31 and 33 in Luke chapter 10. So a priest, right? A priest happened to be going down the road, down the same road, saw the man pass by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and he saw him, and he took pity on him. The priest saw him, walked way to the other side. The Levite was a little bit closer, which he was, it says that he came to the place, which implies that was just a little bit closer to where the priest was. But then the Samaritan came up to him. And it says in the Greek, it basically means like right on top of the Samaritan. And the radical part of this, of this, of this teaching that we're getting into is that we have to be not in proximity of our neighbors, but to love our neighbors means we must be with our neighbors. The priest and the Levite were in proximity. But the Samaritan shared that space. He got up next to him. He got into his space and saw the man's need and then did something about it. The problem that we have today, well, let, me, let me back that up. I, I don't want to lay it on you. I do this. I'm speaking from my experience here through my filter. The problem that I see in my life is that when I see somebody that's on the side of the road or in the place of this person that's beaten and robbed, I tend to turn it into an issue. Well, I can't do anything about the issue of homelessness. What am I going to do? I can't fix this. And yet, that's not what Jesus is calling us to. He's calling us to get into this person's space. Now, I'm not advocating... To, to help when it hurts, right? Because sometimes when we try to help, it actually ends up hurting the person. I'm not advocating for that. What I am saying is that Jesus is calling us to stop keeping people at an arm's length and start joining them in their suffering. And the church is, is, is just as guilty of this. We reduce people to issues and then we argue about how to fix the issues. If we'll write a big enough check, we can write a check to that village and they'll get food and then we've done our part. And yes, that check needs to be written so those people eat, but there's so much more systematically that can be done. We cast judgment on people, right? We look at them standing on the side of the road or, or uh, having difficulty paying their bills, and we'll say things like, well, they're just too lazy to work. 
they, they made their own bed. Maybe. And, but nobody asked those questions. The Samaritan didn't ask that question of the man traveling to Jericho, which was a well-known road and a well-known road known for robbers. He didn't stop and ask, well, why, why would you travel alone, you moron? You got what you got. I mean, duh. You knew this was going to happen. Why would you do this? But none of that. He joined him in his space. No ridicule, right? No judgment. Just joined him. And we're called to love people. And we can't love people if we're in just proximity to them. We can only love people when we are with them. So the question is, is who are you called to be with? Are you with them? If not, then why not? And then I would say, what do you need to change today to make that happen? So you can't love your neighbor if you're not with your neighbor. <laughs> to, to love our neighbor also means this. To love our neighbor means we must yearn for our neighbor. Okay, I'm going to ask you a really weird and random question. I can probably guarantee you nobody's ever asked you this sitting in a church service. All right? What comes to mind when I say the word bowels? <laughs> you don't have to answer that out loud, Barack. Not towels, bowels. And he, I was going to say, don't answer it, just think quietly about it. But then my son was like, nope, here it is. What if I were to tell you that to love your neighbor means that you were to yearn for them with your bowels? It is, isn't it? But I'll tell you why. All right. Look at that verse 33 again. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. All right. Now, the word that, that is written here for, for pity or compassion is in the Greek, splagnitomai. Yep, that's the Greek word, and that is how it's pronounced in English, splagnitomai, all right? Splagnitomai literally means to yearn with your bowels. In the first century, the gut was the center of empathy and love and compassion. So it's like this gut reaction, right? Like if you, if you see something and you know you have to do something about it, you have a gut reaction. It's not any different. They thought that the seat of all of those emotions were in the gut, in the bowels. And so splagnitomai literally means to yearn with your bowels. And that word is only used in the New Testament. It's only used in relation to Jesus. Every time Jesus saw somebody or saw the Israelites and had compassion on them, it's the word splagnitomai. The only three times that it happens in the New Testament that it's not Jesus is where Jesus is telling a story. He's talking about a, a judge that forgave a lifetime of debt. He took pity on the person. It's the, it's the, uh, the, the father, the prodigal son. When he sees them far off, he sees them and has compassion and runs to him. Splagnitomai. All right. And then here, when the Samaritan saw the man. And took pity on him, had compassion, splagnitzomai. And here's why that's important. Jesus isn't calling us to fix the system in that moment, right? Like, absolutely, we should advocate for systematic change. If, if there's oppression anywhere, there's oppression everywhere. So absolutely, Christians should be all about dismantling systems of oppression that keep our brothers and sisters in their place. We should absolutely advocate and fight for those things. But in that moment, that's not the job that Jesus is calling us to. Jesus is calling us to this visceral gut reaction to the brokenness of our world. Splagnitzomai. He's calling us to love them with this, like, I just can't not do something. I can't leave this place without doing something. I know this doesn't change the world, but I'm going to do something for this one person. It's a gut reaction that moves us from compassion to action. And Jesus is saying that to love our neighbors, we have to be with them. And not only, not only must we be with them, but we must be moved into action for them. To love others means that we have to be with 
and for them. So to love radically means that we have to yearn with our bowels. So when we talk about love shift, right? That's what we are talking about. That we're, it's, it's, it's about doing something tangible to better the other situation. We're talking about tangibly affecting the well-being of others. So when we talk about loving people, it's not like this kumbaya moment where we're going to sit around a campfire and hold hands and pretend like everything's okay. It is very much something. We're doing it. To do that, you guys, to, to fight for the well-being of others, then we have to be ready to listen because we have to be ready to hear the other. We have to be ready to lose power. <laughs> Especially, you know, like in my, again, my filter, in my case, as a white, straight, Christian male in the United States, I have all the seats of power, all the seats of privilege, all of them reside right here. And so if I'm going to fight for the other, that means that I have to be ready to relinquish those seats of power that were just given to me. And sometimes that feels bad or feels gross because then it feels like, well, I didn't do anything wrong and why are you coming at me? Yes, I could look at it that way or I could look at it as I have been blessed with this so that I can bless others, right? So that I can be in relation with them and I can yearn for them this way and I have the tools to do so. So I have to be for you and I have to look after your well-being. The same as I look after mine. Now look here. And if that wasn't radical enough, did you notice how Jesus ends the story? Look at verse 36. Which of the, he asks the, now don't forget he's talking to this lawyer. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Now listen to what this guy says. The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. He could not even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. It was that guy that did the thing. Blah. He couldn't even say the word Samaritan. All right. Hear me when I say it again, that Jesus took the most hated, the most marginalized, reviled people group, and he made them the hero, the God character. Now, just so you understand, again, how radical this really is. There were only two schools of thought when it came to love your neighbor. And it was propagated by two different rabbis. Hillel, which was a more conservative rabbi, who said, love your neighbor means your fellow Jews, but not the Romans. Absolutely not. Not the oppressor. Shammai said, oh, I flip-flopped I flip those. Shammai was the conservative one. Hillel was the more liberal one, if you want to put it in those terms. He said... That, of course, the Jews, your fellow Jew is your neighbor, and even the Roman oppressors are your neighbor. You're called to love them. But nobody, and I mean nobody, would say that the Samaritans were a neighbor. They both said, absolutely not. We absolutely do not love them. And Jesus blew both of them out of the water with his kind of radical love. So to love our neighbor means that we have to let go of our preconceived notions of who our neighbor actually is. And the Jews would have been so offended at this. And I think that's part of the point. Jesus is telling them and telling us that there are zero limits to who our neighbors are. Who offends you the most? You don't have to say it out loud. Don't say it. Don't say it out loud. <laughs> That'll cause a problem. But who offends you the most? Then goes Blagnito mine for them. Who offends you the most? You have to spend time with them. You have to know their stories. You have to fight for better for them, whoever you're they are. Jesus wants us to see past the issue and start to see the person and then fight for that person. Okay, Joe, that's great, but what about dot, dot, dot? But here's the thing, there is no but. There is no one. Who, who offends you the most? That's who you call to, to, to yearn for. Is it the LGBTQ plus community? It's blood needs of mine. 
Is it people that have been duped by the QAnon cult? It's blood meat so much. Is it, uh, let's, get, let's get really real here, shall we? Is it the libtards? It's blood meat so much. Is it Trumpers? It's blood meat so much. Well, if we're going to talk about it, let's talk about it. Whoever the other is for you, that's who you're called to splag nitsumai. You're never going to forget that word. There is no group outside of this yearning. There's no group outside of that grace or that love. We must let go of the idea that there is a limit to who we're called to love like this. As a matter of fact, Jesus holds this idea of love in such high regard that he gave the entire world permission to judge us based on that. John 13, 34, and 35. Listen to what he says. A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, that word in the Hebrew is the word agab. And it means to breathe after. And I love that picture. Okay? It's to breathe after. It's, it, it's, um, there, there's a romantic tent to it, but not necessarily. But it is basically that idea that you can't live without this object of affection. Like, it is your neck, very next breath. You breathe after this. Notice what Jesus didn't say here, people. He didn't say that you're going to recognize my followers based on what church they do or do not go to. Or if they, if they go to any at all. He didn't say if they believe this certain thing over here, then they're my follower. If they, if they know these certain Bible verses or these certain things, they are my follower. They have this certain systematic theology. They go to the Baptist church or the first Baptist church or the second Baptist church or the First Missionary Baptist Church, or the Christian Church, or the Church of Christ, or the, the Disciples of Christ, or the, I mean, how many, it can't be that, because even amongst ourselves, we argue about what to think and what to believe is the correct, it couldn't be that. And so what does Jesus say marks the life of his followers? Love, and how well we do it. And how well we do it. That's how important love is. It's not about the denomination or the sign on the church building. It's who we're loving and how we're doing it. If, 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 this, if, if you don't have a people group, if you never thought about people and you're not yearning for them, if you're not moving to action, if you're not breathing after them, then you have to say, am I really following the Jesus that I'm seeing here? And if we're not doing those things, then, then we're wasting your time, right? We're, I know we're wasting mine. And we're wasting Gainesville's time. Oh, well, good, look, another church. And what's really crazy about this idea is that we celebrate this every stinking week, you guys. Every week, we gather around a symbolic table and we take these small little representations of love, of absolutely insane, radical love, and we celebrate and we remember and mourn what Jesus did because of that love. Like we consume this every week and then we go and we do whatever we do. And so this morning, I'm gonna pray for us. And as we think through this idea of what it means to love, that there is no boundary to that love, that all people are worthy of that love, and that we're called to show them that, that we're gonna take a moment and we're gonna remember what Jesus did to show us that, right? And so we're gonna take that little cup and we're gonna take that little cracker and we're gonna remember that this embodies the blood and, and, and flesh of Jesus, the body and, and blood of Jesus. And what he did not only so that we would know his love, but so that we could show others his love and that all of creation, not just us individually and not just us here in the United States, but all creation, all creation would be reconciled back to him. So may these symbols call us back 
to when Jesus yearned for us, but also push us forward to yearn for others in that same way. Let's pray. Father, we, we just want to come before you as we get ready to take these small symbols of, of your love. And God, I pray that you would break our hearts uh, for, for the things that break your heart. God, help us to begin to see people differently. Help us to, to see the, the divinity in all of them. And in every one of them, you. God, help us to stop seeing these labels that we have put on people or that have been put on them and start seeing you in them. God, I pray that you would, that you would convict me of those groups that I just don't want to spend time with. And I, I pray the same thing for all of us. I pray that you give us opportunities to, to share, table with them, to hear their stories, to lay down our guard of trying to be right versus wrong or trying to defend a certain ideology, but just get to know people. And God, I pray that we would be a place of the third way. Lord, we know that you gather around tables with, with a tax collector and a, and a, um, a freedom fighter. And you love them just the same. And so God, help us to do that. Give us opportunities to practice that. Forgive us when we fall short. But God, I pray that you would work in all of it. And so Lord, right now as we take these small symbols, God, I pray that we would remember your spark needs of mine for us, your compassion for us, and then help us to give that to others. In your name we pray. Amen.